Right. Uh, welcome to chapter three. Uh, 3.1 is going to be a very brief chapter that basically just defines a bunch of vocabulary and concepts. But uh, the general tone of chapter three is set here. And in fact, actually was set earlier in chapter two through the various problems. So uh, if you did a lot of the problems back in chapter two, particularly for the ones that involved solving for the actual wave function and finding the valid energies, uh, what you should have found was that in many, pretty much in every case, uh, your problem gets reduced to solving a system of equations for the boundary conditions and finding the coefficients A, B, C, D, E, F, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and this is pretty much going to happen every time you try to solve a wave function is that uh, you're going to get reduced to a series or a system of equations that include, you know, coefficients that you basically have to solve for by plugging in your boundary conditions. Uh, what that basically implies is that since every single quantum mechanics problem ultimately boils down to solving the system of equations to get the wave function, uh, it implies that the sort of the more natural language for quantum mechanics isn't calculus and algebra, but more so uh, sort of linear algebra, uh, in, as opposed to sort of uh, traditional differential equations and calculus. So because of that, uh, chapter three is pretty much going to redefine everything we learned in chapter two, but in terms of linear algebra. And since we're learning linear algebra now, uh, we're going to convert from differential equations to vector equations. So uh, 3.1 is then just going to be a rehash of a lot of the stuff we know about from linear algebra. Uh, if you don't know linear algebra, uh, you should learn it because it is uh, pretty much mandatory if you want to understand quantum mechanics at a higher level, like for Griffiths. Um, but yeah, so because of that, uh, I'm not going to be going super in depth on a lot of the al uh, linear algebra concepts. I'm going to just assume that you already know them. Uh, but on a very basic level, ultimately, you know, linear algebra deals with vectors. So uh, there's a bit of a special notation that we use in quantum mechanics for vectors. Uh, so let's say I have a vector alpha. Traditionally, you write the vector alpha like this with the vector arrow above it. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we instead define it using this notation. So this is the same as a vector, and obviously we would define it in terms of its components, alpha 1 all the way to alpha n. And this basically denotes an n-dimensional vector. Similarly, in, uh, quant in linear algebra, we also have transformations. So transformations are effectively these big matrices that when you multiply them to a vector, uh, you produce a new vector. So given a transformation matrix T, you know, this is going to be something T11, T12, blah, 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 all the way to T1N, and then similarly down here to TN1, and then similarly down here all the way to TNN. So this is basically a square matrix, an M by N square matrix. Uh, if I have a, if I have this operating on my vector alpha, I'm going to get a new vector beta according to the laws of matrix multiplication. Because remember, this is a, uh, this is an n row by one column, or sorry, one by n matrix. And this is an n by n matrix. So the result, when you multiply a one by n by an n by n, is going to be another one by n matrix, therefore a new vector beta. So, uh, Pretty much this is ultimately what everything boils down to because in quantum mechanics, it's going to turn out that your wave function actually satisfies all of the required conditions to be represented as a vector like this. And it turns out that operators, things like you know position, velocity, acceleration, and whatnot, can be represented actually as transformations. Uh, and what happens is we act on the wave function vector with our transformation matrix and we get a new vector that defines the value of whatever observable we're trying to measure. So if we act on our wave function matrix with the transformation uh, matrix that is defined by position, we get values for position. So every single operator, whatever, whatever sort of observable that you want to measure, whether it be position, velocity, acceleration, energy, and so on and so on, they all have their own defined linear transformation matrices. When you act on the wave function vector, you get the actual values for whatever absorbable thing you want in the form of another matrix. Now, how this is actually derived and how it works will be went will be gone over in later sections, 
3.1 is just introducing this idea to you as a concept. So just think that over and sort of accept this idea that in quantum mechanics, wave functions are vectors and operators like position, velocity, and acceleration are considered linear transformations. And when these transformations act on our wave function vector, we get a new vector that defines the actual values of whatever we're trying to measure. Now, next, we're going to have to define what's called Hilbert space. So Hilbert space is basically a way of making our work more manageable. And what I mean by this is, let's consider, consider how to turn a function f of x into a vector. So let's let's start very really, really simple. Uh, let's suppose that I have an arbitrary polynomial, f of x equals summation from n equals you know zero to infinity uh, of a n x to the power of n. So this is you know a naught plus a one x one plus a two x squared plus blah 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 all the way to uh, the infinite term a infinite to the power of times x to the power of infinity. This is a summation equation that represents every single possible polynomial in existence. So if I wanted to represent this as a vector, I could write it as a vector f being defined as a1, a0, a1, blah, 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 all the way to a infinity. Hopefully you realize the problem because this has infinite dimensions. You know, this is an infinitely large matrix if we wanted to actually multiply this by any linear transformation thing, uh, we would never be able to finish it because it has an infinite number of terms. Therefore, we have to do an infinite number of calculations. Therefore, we never can finish anything with this. This is just polynomials. You know, recognize the fact that you know functions can also have special things like trig things and a bunch of the various other special functions we encountered when solving some of the more complicated potentials in chapter two, and you sort of can start understanding this idea that, you know, we can't really use the entire function vector space because it's just way too big. You know, this is an infinitely sized matrix just with polynomials. If we introduce sinusoids, you know, trig functions, special other special functions, logarithms, things like that, it becomes even bigger. But no matter what, it's always going to be infinity. So we can't work with that. You know, if we assumed that our psi wave function sort of uh, encompasses this vector space, then psi is going to be infinite dimensional. That's horrible. You know, you're not going to be able to solve anything because any equation that you come up with is going to have an infinite dimensional vector that has to be calculated. And it's going to take an infinite amount of time to do it. So we need to somehow reduce our infinite dimensional vector space into something that can actually be written down and solved in a finite amount of time. And that's where Hilbert space comes in. Because Hilbert space basically defines the set of functions that are square integ integrable. So what that means is that f of x, such that the integral over a given region of interest, that can be from negative infinity to infinity or any other region that you're dealing with. So I'm going to say from a to b of f of x, such, th such that its magnitude squared in this integral is going to be less than infinity. Because the moment that this happens, now I have a finite uh, magnitude squared integral. I can now normalize this function. It is now, it satisfies all the conditions required to be a wave function now. So this is Hilbert space, basically. Uh, Hilbert space basically is just a condition that we impose onto our functions. And this condition is strict enough that it, it is, in many cases, going to reduce our vector space from something that's infinite dimensional to something that is actually finite. Uh, we will see this in action when we actually start working with problems in the later sections, but just know that when we apply this condition, uh, it reduces our vector space into something that's actually manageable. As for how exactly it does that, we'll see that later down the line. Now that we're done with vector, now that we're done with Hilbert space, uh, the next thing we're going to want to do is actually we're going to define a new operator. Uh, 
And by operator, I mean something along the lines of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc., etc. Because what we notice is that in quantum mechanics, we take the integral of magnitude squared a lot. You know, if we have a wave function psi, you know, the probability distribution, rho of x is equal to the integral from negative infinity, or not is equal, not from the integral, but the probability distribution is equal to the magnitude squared of psi. And since psi is generally, you know, a complex function, the magnitude of a complex function is going to be its complex conjugate multiplied by itself. So this thing appears a lot, right? Uh, this idea of taking the magnitude squared to get probability happens a lot because the whole point of finding your wave function is to figure out what's the probability of being in any given observable state, whether it be position, velocity, acceleration, so on, so on, so on. So this operation of multiplying a function by its complex conjugate evidently happens a lot. So we want to define an operation that basically writes this in shorthand. It makes it easier for us to sort of write out our work. So uh, this is going to be called the inner product. And the inner product, basically, the reason why we write our vectors this way is to actually facilitate inner product. Because inner product, the notation for it is defined this way. So given vectors alpha and beta, the inner product is written like this. So this is our traditional vector notation. If we take inner product, then we just reverse the notation and basically write it this way in this condensed form. And the definition for this is just you're taking, it's the same concept as a magnitude squared, but you're applying it to a vector and its individual elements instead. So instead of multiplying the entire function by its complex conjugate, you're gonna multiply the components of the vectors themselves. So what, you're, what this is gonna equal is gonna be alpha one star times beta one plus alpha two star times beta two plus alpha three star times beta three and so on and so on and so on. Now, note here, this is obviously no longer commutative. If I reverse this order, this is now equal to beta one star alpha one plus beta two star alpha two plus beta three star times alpha three, so on and so on. So obviously, if I switch the order of an inner product, it is no longer commute, it is no longer the same. And this actually happens a lot in linear algebra. Generally, whoa, I just zoomed in, apologies. Uh, generally, in linear algebra, uh, most operations are not commutative. You know, a vector, uh, a matrix A multiplied by a matrix B is not generally equal to a matrix B multiplied by a matrix A. The same thing is happening here when we start working with vectors. Now, to see how this actually translates into functions, remember, this is not something we derived. This is an operation we defined. So instead of working with vectors, if we instead have a function, you know, f of x and g of x, we define the inner product of two functions as just the magnitude squared integration. So this operation is just defined as an integral in your region of interest, remember, because remember, we have to define our region of interest in the first place for Hilbert space uh, of f star g dx like that. So basically, uh, we're, we're just writing out our own little operator here and defining it in this way. And it has a vector definition up here, and it has a function definition down here. Now, uh, this is actually going to lead into a very important thing, which is that we have to make sure that if we're going to work with this, you know, idea a lot in linear algebra, uh, we're going to have to verify that this thing is actually also part of Hilbert space. Because if this ends up, you know, if this ends up going to infinity, then this thing is no longer in Hilbert space, we can't work with it anymore. Because remember, a wave function, by definition, has to live in Hil Hilbert space, right? If I do something with this wave function and make it so that it's no longer square integrable, then I can no longer work with it because now instantly it's now instead defined in the overall larger function vector space, which is infinite dimensional. So uh, this is actually proved and Griffiths directly states this proof uh, through something called the Schwartz inequality. And this is something that we will actually derive in a later problem, but for now we're just gonna list it 
Schwartz inequality basically says that the magnitude of the inner product of two things, f star g dx, is always going to be less than or equal to the square root of the integral of the magnitude squared of f dx plus the integral of the magnitude squared of g dx. So if this thing is finite and this thing is finite, their sum is going to be finite and the square root of their sum is also going to be finite. And according to the Schwartz inequality, since this value is always less than or equal to this value, this term is also going to be finite. Therefore, this is square integrable. And I, that's about it, honestly. Uh, that's pretty much everything that we define in uh, 3.1. This is all the new terminology. So as a recap, in 3.1, we defined Hilbert space. We recapped on, uh, or we didn't recap, but we defined a new notation for writing vectors in quantum mechanics. Uh, we reviewed linear transformations. Uh, we defined Hilbert space, uh, explained why we need it for the purpose of wave functions. And then we defined this new thing that's called an inner product. And you're very quickly going to see in later chapters why this inner product thing is so important, because it's going to pop up pretty much everywhere. Uh, if you think, right, remember, um, if you if you sort of think about, as a sneak peek, if you sort of think about one of the earlier chapters when we calculated observables, right, the expectation value of a quantity is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of psi star times the operator of that quantity times psi dx. There is a way to rewrite this in terms of inner product notation because instantly you see, you know, there's a psi star and then a psi. So uh, there is, we're, we're gonna find a way to basically, uh, and since this shows up everywhere, basically, we're gonna find a way to rewrite this in terms of our more compact notation. And uh, that's 3.1. So we will move on to the problems now.